Good morning and welcome everybody. This is uh, part two of our international tax reform webinars. In this uh, presentation, we'll be uh, discussing the exciting world of guilty, FDII, and, and BEAT. My name is Ron Scharnberg, and with me is uh, John Lobb and Don Lontag. Um, I guess before we begin, um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please email them to Megan Green, and we will answer them following the presentation or via email. Um, her email is uh, megan.green at bakerbots.com. Uh, for purposes of the all-important CLE credit, uh, this will be announced at the end of the presentation, approximately 50 minutes in. Uh, please include this uh, code on the affirmation form, which you can download in the reminder email which was sent to you yesterday. If you do not have this form, please email Megan Green again at megan.green at bakerbots.com. All right, so let's begin with part two of the uh, the webinar. So what are we what are we going to take away from, from this presentation today as we kind of discuss guilty, FDII, and B? Well, first, as you will notice, guilty limits the reach of the participation exemption and imposes a current minimum tax on a deemed intangible return of CFCs. Another important takeaway is the aggregation impacts of guilty can lead to unexpected and, and perhaps what many would consider distorted guilty results. Uh, guilty also results in new Section 338 election considerations uh, with respect to, uh, you know, uh, transactions involving foreign targets. You know, under the prior regime, the 338 election was often utilized in connection with foreign targets and preferred on both sides of the equation, uh, but now guilty brings another layer to that analysis. FDII may not be enough to ultimately incentivize business investment or to cause IP to be moved back to the United States. BEAT can actually act as an AMT type liability and, and also result in double U.S. taxation of the same income. Uh, and this is mainly or primarily related to how it perhaps interacts with, with guilty and uh, subpart F. And then finally, careful planning may allow for you know, some reduction in, in BEAT liability. So as we walk through this presentation, there'll be uh, you know, several examples and, and illustrations that, that kind of show some of the uh, the, the transaction structuring and other impacts of these provisions. And so in those illustrations, the, the legend that we'll be utilizing for a corporation, we will have a rectangle, a, a partnership will be a triangle, uh, an, an oval circle will be a disregarded entity, and then if we're talking about a U.S. entity, it will be a gray uh, colored shape, and then if it's a foreign entity, it will be a red colored shape. So as we begin, let's turn to section one now, which is guilty, the global intangible low tax income. So guilty begins a, a United States shareholder of a CFC is required to include in income its guilty for such taxable year. For this purpose, a, a person will be treated as a U.S. shareholder if such person meets the 10% stock ownership requirements on the last day in the taxable year of such corporation on which it is, CF, it is a CFC. And the importance of this um, statement here is that in the event that, that you're a U.S. shareholder and you have a CFC, and if you were to, you know, sell the CFC to a, to a non-kind of U.S. buyer where the base of the CFC is no longer a CFC for the remainder of the tax year, similar to like what would happen in subpart F situations, you know, the income and earnings of that, of that CFC throughout the remainder of the tax year could actually impact you know, your overall guilty calculation. Um, now, there would be a pro rata sharing of those income and earnings, but nonetheless, it's something to be, to be mindful of, it, that this is tied to basically who was ever the last kind of U.S. shareholder on the last day of the CFC's taxable year, which it is actually a CFC. So then as we get into guilty, um, but there's a deduction that's available to corporate U.S. shareholders for guilty, and that's equal to 50%. Uh, basically guilty plus the gross up for foreign taxes, and that's through 2025. It's then 37.5% deduction for the guilty component beginning in, in 2026. And ultimately, the effect of such deduction is, is to make the minimum effective tax rate for guilty at least equal to 10.5% through 2025 and 13.125% beginning in 2026. Um, there's also up to an 80% foreign tax credit that's potentially available for corporate U.S. shareholders. 
but however, you know, ultimately the way this works then is due to this 80% uh, foreign tax credit limitation, uh, ultimately additional U.S. taxes will result from the guilty related income if the effective foreign tax rate on the guilty income is not at least 13.125% through 2025 and 16.406% beginning in 2026. Also, which is very important from the guilty perspective is that uh, guilty creates basically a separate foreign tax credit basket, at least with respect to non-passive guilty income. And also, and, and then very importantly, any of the foreign taxes that are actually paid or accrued with respect to guilty income, there is no carry forward or carry back of such foreign taxes for foreign tax credit purposes. And so, you know, if, if you think about that, this, this, this is one area in which there can be potentially, you know, distorted results from the, the theoretical aspect of guilty, which is, you know, due to the, the inability to carry forward or carry back the foreign taxes, if, they're, if the U.S. and foreign taxing systems don't match perfectly, you know, there could be scenarios where the actual effective foreign tax rate from an actual true economic perspective is much higher than this 13.125% through 2025 or 16.4% uh, beginning in 2026 uh, due to the fact that you're not able to basically carry forward and carry back these foreign taxes and, and due to a lack of a perfect matching and timing system. So what is guilty as we dive into it? Well, guilty is basically the net CFC tested income minus a net deemed tangible income return. And so net CFC tested income generally means a CFC's gross income other than U.S. effectively connected income, subpart F income, amounts excluded from subpart F income under the high tax exception, dividends received from a related person, and foreign oil and gas extraction income. And then that's less deductions, including taxes that are properly allocable to such income. So basically, as you can see by that definition, you know, guilty captures a large component of what would be a foreign, a lot of foreign CFCs uh, uh, earnings and income. So, so that's the starting point. It's guilty captures a, a significant component of, of the income that most CFCs would typically earn. But then, as I indicated, you subtract out the net deemed tangible income return. And the net deemed tangible income return is generally equal to basically 10% of the, of, of the aggregate of the U.S. shareholder share of a CFC's qualified business asset investment, which is QBAI, and that is generally a, basically involves a quarterly average of the CFC's tax basis in tangible depreciable property used in its tr uh, trader business. So basically, QBAI is specifically a tangible depreciable type property. And then also the net deemed tangible income will then also pull out uh, sort of subtract out interest expense that was taken into account um, by the, the U.S. shareholder in the net, in the basically in the net tested income component. So now that we have that understanding, you know how is guilty calculated when you're when you're involving you know multiple CFCs? Well, so the net tested, so the technically the net CFC tested income will then equal the aggregate tested income of each CFC over the aggregate tested loss of the of each CFC. So basically, what you do is, is you would look at each CFC's components and figure out if they're actually a tested income or a tested loss situation, and then you would aggregate it to figure out the ultimate aggregate combined net tested income. Um, so tested income exists when a CFC's guilty gross income exceeds the deductions allocable to such gross income. Tested loss exists then when a CFC's gross income inclusions are less than the deductions. So basically, depending on whether or not the, the income exceeds the deductions or the deductions exceed the income, you're in the tested income or tested law situation. Now, these terms are going to be a little bit more important in this aggregation concept as we get into a little bit more of the detail concerning guilty. So then, you know, one of the important aspects of, of why these are important is that the net deemed tangible income return, which is, you know, the 10% QBAI number that's subtracted out of guilty, you know, it appears based on the technical provisions of the of the code to only include tangible property of a CFC if such TS, CFC actually has tested income. So the way the code sets up, it, it looks like that if there is if there are tested loss entities, that their tangible property is not actually captured then ultimately in this in the guilty uh, uh, net deemed tangible income return calculation. And ultimately, what that can do then is cause you know, increased guilty income. So, you know, one question that, you know, you know, you think about, right, is that if you're, if you know you're going to be in a scenario where you have tested loss entities, 
that will have um, you know tangible property or a significant amount of tangible property. You know, it may make sense then in those situations to explore check the box selections and basically utilize perhaps an aggregation approach through kind of disregarded entity concept versus having you know the kind of separate CFCs type concept under the, under the guilty provisions. So the other important thing about you know this the aggregation component in, in connection with this tested income and tested loss is that if you if you if you really comb through the uh, foreign tax credit provisions, it appears that for purposes of the foreign tax credit, you only get to take into account foreign taxes paid or accrued if it's attributable to tested income of the CFC. So again, if if a if a CFC is is uh, is in a tested loss situation, then then you in those situations it does not necessarily appear that that therefore any foreign taxes that they pay or accrue in that year, you know, could be allowed to ultimately offset or reduce the ultimate guilty liability. Now perhaps the theory behind this was that, well, if they're in a test at loss, they shouldn't be paying foreign taxes. Is probably my best guess is probably the, the theoretical kind of um, uh, perspective behind it. But again, you know, the, the guilty tax is computed based off U.S. principles and foreign principles might be slightly different. So you could have situations where there might be a test at loss for, for, uh, for U.S. income principle purposes, but then under foreign principles, you could be in an income situation, therefore actually paying foreign taxes. But again, that's another technicality under the, under the guilty calculation. So now let's dive into um, basically a, a simple guilty example. And before we do that, let's walk through just a couple of the facts and assumptions that we're going to utilize. So in this example, we're just going to show the impact of guilty under the based on the the, pre, the previous uh, system and then now the new system under guilty. So basically, we're going to assume that there's no dividend repatriation. The foreign earnings are basically being reinvested in foreign operations. There's no ECI. There's no subpart F income. There's no subpart F income that's that's accepted under the high tax exception. Uh, there's no related party dividends or no foreign oil and gas extraction income. So there's basically all the income here would line up to be guilty and guilty uh, uh, income itself. And then we're going to assume that the final finished product sales price is $1,000. There's an initial cost of raw products of $500, manufacturing cost of $225, other operating cost expenses of $75, and then ultimately the combined foreign taxes are $15. And then the U.S. tax basis of the tangible property is, is $250. So if we walk through this example before guilty, what we would start with is we'd have our gross revenue line item of, of, of 1000 subtract out the, the raw products and the manufacturing cost, and we're left with now a gross product of 275 If you subtract out then the other operating costs and expenses of $75, you are left with net income of 200 we paid, you know, fifteen dollars of foreign taxes. There was no subpart F income, so in the prior system and no repatriation, you know, our after-tax cash for reinvestment was one hundred and eighty-five dollars, and ultimately our effective tax rate was seven point five percent on this on this combined income. Well, now if we look at the guilty calculation, you know, the first thing now we have to do is figure out, okay, how much guilty exists. Um, you know, we'll walk through this kind of in, in, in a little detail here, but it's important any time that you're doing this calculation to really just go, you know, walk through the code as it lines up step by step because there are gross up components to ensure that the taxes are properly taken into account and that they're properly reflected because of the foreign tax credit. So you just need to make sure anytime you're actually doing this calculation yourself that you truly kind of walk line item by line item to make sure everything kind of gets factored in appropriately. So as we walk through the guilty calculation though here, we have the net CFD tested income, which includes the deduction for the foreign taxes of 185. Then we have what is our, our net deemed tangible income return, which again is that $250 U.S. tax basis times 10, 10%. That leaves us the guilty income of 160. So basically from that 160, we now get a 50% deduction of Basically, it's guilty plus the gross up for the taxes of, of 86.49. The guilty inclusion is, is 73.51, and then if we then again regross that up for the taxes on the component, we're then at 86.49 of a grossed up guilty inclusion, which is then times the U.S. the, the corporate tax rate of 21%, and ultimately the the gross U.S. taxes on that guilty then would be 18.16, and then if we then pull out the 80% foreign tax credit on those, you know, $15 of foreign taxes, 
we're then left with the new net, now net U.S. taxes on guilty of 778. So effectively, under these fact patterns, guilty is down at seven dollars and seventy-eight cents of additional taxes. And so, therefore, if we run through our overall effective tax rate calculation and we add those taxes into the equation, we're now left with an after-tax cash ultimately on the same income of. 177.22 for reinvestment, and ultimately now our effective tax rate on the same income has gone up from the prior example to 11.39%. So this kind of just illustrates in a, in a simple form how guilty can can basically impact um, you know the overall effective tax rate on on foreign income. So one interesting thing that is kind of if you really start walking through or observing guilty is the impact that or, or the the impacts that kind of the foreign taxes have on your overall effective tax rate. And so this is kind of a correlation of the graph that shows it. So if you, if you notice at the very beginning of the lines, in that, in that world we're living in where there's actually zero foreign taxes on the income. And so your, your overall effective tax rate on that income due to guilty is 10.5%. But then as you pay any, any level of foreign taxes, the line, you know, that the effective tax rate starts to go up slightly and then the foreign Tax rate, you know, goes up, you know, um, uh, a, a lot, a lot higher. It, it happens a lot quicker, but ultimately you arrive at the 13.125 percent, which is once your effective foreign tax rate, you know, equals the um, the appropriate amount, then there should be no more, you know, guilty tax liability. But I always thought it, it's an interesting correlation how how this works, and I think at least it was explained to me that perhaps the theory behind this is is that you know, the U.S. did not want to um, incentivize the foreign jurisdictions to impose a certain level of tax up to the 10.5 percent on this type of income. So this kind of stepping up process perhaps disincentivizes that approach. So now let's walk through kind of a, you know, as we laid out, there were some aggregation type potential issues related to the, to the guilty component. So we'll walk through in kind of real world examples to show, you know, perhaps how, how this, you know, actually works in theory then. So if we assume we have a U.S. parent and it has basically just three CFC subs in, in this example, and we have CFC, CFC 1 has tested income of 100, tangible property of 100, CFC 2 has tested income of 100 and tangible property of 100, and CFC 3 has tested loss of 100 and then tangible property of 100. So in this situation, we basically have two tested income subs and one tested loss subs. So as I indicated, whenever you start to aggregate under guilty, you know, there are kind of these nuances that come into play. So if we were to sit back and think of a simple aggregation concept, what we would look at is we would just add everything together, basically. We'd have $100, $100 of combined net tested income because of the $200 of tested income minus the tested loss. They have a combined $300 of tangible property times 10 times the um, the, the, the guilty return of 10%, so you're at 30, that leaves you guilty of 70, 50% deduction, 35, so you're left with a, a guilty inclusion of 35, and then if you use the corporate tax rate of 21%, you're left at 7, 735 of, of your additional tax liability. <clears throat> but now, under the guilty aggregation rules, as we explained, if you have a tested loss sub, at least the code appears to say that the tangible property of that entity is not included in the, the QBAI, QBAI calculation. So therefore, if we walk through that calculation, we're now only at $20 of, of, of deduction from the $100 of tested income. So that now leaves us guilty of 80, a deduction then of 40, and ultimately a guilty inclusion of $40, which results in now additional U.S. taxes of $8.40. So because, again, the definition of specified tangible property refers to property used in the production of tested income, it does not appear that the tangible property of CFC3 would be able to utilize in this calculation. So again, that's kind of one of the, the potential traps under the guilty models. A similar example exists as we talked about in the foreign tax situation. So in this example, we're going to assume we have you know, tested income subs again, and then we have foreign taxes that they pay. Uh, Five dollars each, and then we have a tested loss sub where it actually paid three dollars and thirteen cents of foreign taxes. So if we work through kind of the models again, what we ultimately end up with is under the simple aggregation approach. As you can see, it under the, the combined income, they paid uh, you know a, enough foreign taxes ultimately to to ensure that there's not any 
any additional uh, guilty income. But if you if you look at the the guilty aggregation approach, the way it works again is the tested for, for purposes of the definition of tested foreign income taxes, it refers to foreign income taxes paid or accrued by CFC, which are proper properly attributable to tested income of such CFC. So again, it looks like the CFC three, the, the foreign taxes that it pays, basically get backed out of the, the 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 calculation and ultimately will result in additional you know U.S. taxes uh, under the model. So you know, again, any time that you're dealing with multiple CFCs, it's important. And if you have an idea that there could be tested loss entities or tested income entities, you know, as we discussed, there, it may be beneficial to explore um, opportunities to, to, to try to combine, you know, perhaps the income or, or the losses, in essence, uh, you know, using disregarded entities or check-the-box selections. So one of the other kind of big and important traps under the guilty model or potential traps, which I know is still being uh, considered and worked out, you know, the, the Treasury Department and the IRS, I know, are all over this issue. It's been discussed, you know, several times in a lot of uh, conferences and materials, um, but they're still trying to, the, the, at this point, there's not enough guidance to see how exactly it's going to shape out. But in this example, we'll assume that we have uh, the gross up guilty is, is $100, and we're going to assume the foreign taxes are 1313 and then if we assume there's $10 of, of interest expense, you know, that could be, you know, allocable to the CFC for Section 904 purposes. And if we run through basically the models and the way it works, then is there's, unfortunately, the, the Section 904 ultimate foreign tax credit limitation calculation. And, you know, that ultimately overlays any foreign tax credits that you're going to utilize from a guilty perspective. And so technically, this interest was basically, let's, you know, interest of basically the parent, that gets allocated potentially under 904 principles, you know, to the guilty uh, subsidiaries. And so when you do that, you, you basically, it's not, it's not technically allocated for guilty purposes in the actual guilty calculation itself, but it only gets picked up then under this foreign tax credit limitation. And so ultimately, when you, if, you, if you allocate this interest expense to the guilty inclusion, you've now reduced the guilty inclusion for foreign tax credit purposes from 50 down to 40. And if you multiply it on the corporate tax rate of 21%, the limitation in this situation is basically 840. And so as a result of that, even though you actually paid enough foreign taxes, you're not actually, uh, you know, there's not any, there's an actual additional guilty inclusion because of the interest allocation. And so again, this is, I know, an issue that, that the IRS and Treasury Department is fully aware, and it'll be interesting to see how it ultimately plays out uh, with respect to these guilty rules and provisions. But the, the form, this foreign tax credit limitation is, is, is again, something that it can really impact uh, the guilty calculation and, and require, basically, a higher effective foreign tax rate than what was kind of advertised um, in, in the guilty materials. So the other kind of final component of guilty that, that, that's important, is, as I indicated, there's guilty now creates this kind of current income taxation of, of, of income of a CFC that, that didn't exist pre-tax reform. And so pre-tax reform, a lot of times a 338 election was made if, if a foreign sub was sold. And the reason why it was made was because the, the deemed asset transaction would often have little or, or no adverse U.S. tax impacts to the seller. And that was due to the fact that often, you know, the sell of the assets would not create any, any subpart F income or any material subpart F income because that was the main concern. Uh, but how, because of the way guilty is defined by this broad component of income and then only backs out basically subpart F income and the deemed 10% tangible return, you know, guilty can result in uh, additional U.S. tax consequences. So as a result of that, you know, the 338 election analysis has gotten more complicated. So any anytime a, a U.S. or CFC seller is selling a, a, a foreign target, and there's a request to either have a Section 338 election or a check and sell type transaction, uh, you know, you, the seller will need to be mindful of the, the guilty impacts of that transaction and, and compare that to, to the, basically the, the participation exempts and impacts of, the, of a stop transaction without such an election. Um, and then any such analysis would also have to properly take into account the FTC and the foreign tax credit impacts. And then also, and then another kind of thing to keep in mind is that if you're selling again to a foreign type buyer, then you know a seller may in certain situations prefer the election so that they can end the tax year as of that date and then not have to worry about buyers post-closing activities impacting the guilty inclusion for the entire taxable year. 
Now, on the buyer side of the equation, if you're a U.S. or CFC buyer, you know, I think generally now, due to guilty, there's probably going to be more of a preference for the 338 election than possibly there existed before, at least as guilty as currently set up, because they would, you know, conceivably get a step up in tax basis of the QBAI for guilty purposes, and therefore what that means is they have more income or a higher amount of income going forward related to their CFCs that will be subject to the pure participation exemption. So those are, you know, again, the guilty uh, potentially changes the 338 impacts um, of a transaction. So now with, with guilty out of the way, I'll turn it to John, and he will uh, operate with respect to foreign-derived intangible income, or FDII. Thanks, Ron. So as Ron talked about, the, uh, the guilty rules provide a, a disincentive effectively for taxpayers to earn intangible income outside the U.S. And the flip side of that is foreign-derived intangible income, or FDII, or some people call it FIDI, or I think the government calls it FODI, um, which is really intended to kind of put, you, put tax rates on U.S. earned intangible income on par with tax rates on foreign intangible income as kind of an incentive to earn that income in the U.S. And as we'll get into, uh, the reduced tax rate is generally applicable to income that's derived in connection with certain export sales, leases, and licenses of property to foreign persons, and then services provided to persons or property that's located outside the U.S. The uh, FDII rules are applicable only to domestic C corporations, and they achieve this reduced tax rate by allowing a deduction of 37.5% of FDII through uh, 2025, and then a lower deduction of 21.875% of FDII beginning in 2026. And the effect of that is that FDII is subject to U.S. tax at a rate of 13.125% through 2025 and 16.406% starting in 2026. And the, the deduction for FDII does end up getting limited when FDII plus the guilty inclusion, including the, the gross up for the foreign taxes on guilty exceed uh, the taxable income determined without regard to, the, to those rules. So what is FDII? Um, FDI is defined like a lot of the new tax reform rules through a series of uh, complicated definitions. So the, the basic equation is FDI equals deemed intangible income times the, foreign, the uh, corporation's foreign-derived deduction-eligible income over deduction-eligible income. The so deemed intangible income is the excess of the corporation's deduction-eligible income over 10% of the corporation's qualified business asset investment, QBAI. And that's the same routine return concept that Ron talked about in the context of the guilty calculation, but it's using deduction eligible income rather than tested income as the uh, kind of basis. So deduction eligible, in or deduction eligible income then is the excess of the corporation's gross income other than subpart F income, guilty, financial services income, dividends received from CFCs domestic oil and gas extraction income and foreign branch income over deductions, including taxes that are properly allocable to gross income. So like guilty, this is a pretty broad category of income. It's not just intangible income, despite the name of the acronym. Um, and like guilty, there are issues on sort of how to properly allocate these expenses or deductions to uh, FDII. So the last key concept in the, the, guilt, or in the FDII definition is foreign-derived deduction-eligible income, and that's any deduction-eligible income that's derived in connection with property that's sold, which for this purpose includes leases and licenses by the corporation to a foreign person for foreign use, or services that the corporation provides to any person or property located outside the U.S. The statute includes a few special rules that relate to foreign use property and services. So one rule is if property is sold to a foreign unrelated party for U.S. manufacturing, then that property is not considered to be sold for foreign use, even if the unrelated party later exports the property. Second, if property is sold to a foreign related party, then that property is not considered to be sold for foreign use unless the related party resells the property to an unrelated party for foreign use. And then if services are provided to a foreign related party, those services are not qualified services eligible for the deduction unless the services are not substantially similar to services provided by the related party to persons located in the U.S. <laughs>
So like, like a lot of the new rules um, under tax reform, there are open questions regarding how to apply the FDII rules. One is um, how to compute a consolidated group's FDII deduction when you have a situation where, for example, one member of the consolidated group licenses IP to another member and then the licensee uses that IP to make an export sale or provide services to a foreign person. In that case, the licensee's income from the third party uh, export sale or, or license or uh, service is FDII and their deduction for the royalty payment paid to the affiliate would generally reduce FDII, but the licensor's royalty income is not FDII because it's not licensing to a related foreign person. And so there's a question about whether the license within the consolidated group has effectively artificially reduced the group's overall FDI deduction. And so a number of commentators have pointed out that that appears to be an inappropriate result and have asked, um, you know, do the consolidated return rules under 1502-13, the intercompany transaction regs, do those principles kind of allow you to conclude that, uh, you know, there's not this artificial understatement? And I think the IRS is studying the issue and has said, you know, they're not uh, going to opine on it at this point, but they're still thinking about it. Another open question relates to whether income that a domestic corporation earns through a partnership uh, can be treated as FDII. So, for example, you have a corporation that's a part in the partnership. The partnership makes export sales or provides foreign services. Is the corporation's share of the partnership income FDII? The literal language of the statute seems to suggest that the corporation itself has to be the one who's making the sales or providing the services, so there, there may be a technical problem with getting that answer. Um, the IRS and the Treasury are aware of that issue, and again, that's one that they've said they're studying. And then finally, as I alluded to before, um, the statute's vague on sort of what expenses are allocable to FDII, and so kind of common expenses like R&D expenses, interest expense, other indirect costs, how are those allocated to FDII? Again, the government's studying it. So, as I mentioned at the outset, the FDII rules are really designed to provide some incentive for corporations to keep operations in the U.S. or perhaps move IP back to the U.S. And is that going to work? Well, I think it's you know undeniable that the FDII rules and, and some other tax reform changes, such as you know the general reduced corporate tax rate and allowing people to immediately expense. Uh, Certain intangible, certain tangible property expenses, um, that makes the U.S. a more attractive location for export and IP-related activities. However, there are some important limitations to keep in mind uh, when evaluating is the FDII regime enough of a, an incentive to move to the U.S. So one is that FDII benefit, it only applies to returns that are in excess of this deemed tangible income return, which is you know, the 10% uh, of QBAI, that amount is still subject to U.S. tax at the full corporate rates of 21%. And that's contrasted to, you know, as Ron talked about in the guilty context, if um, that same type of property is owned outside the U.S., the routine returns are not guilty, and assuming it's not subpart F, would not be subject to U.S. tax and could be uh, distributed without further U.S. tax under the participation exemption. So, so I guess on on that concept, then I guess with with I guess the decision process, right, is kind of comparing what do I expect the tax rate on that income to be. So if it's in the foreign jurisdiction, if it's basically probably um, you know less than the 21% rate, then you're probably better off investing in property outside the U.S. because you get the benefit from a guilty and it's qualified then for participation exemption versus if you make that investment in the U.S., it's now subject to the 21% rate. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then, you know, another limit is, you know, if you're thinking about, well, can IP that's already offshore be moved back to the U.S. to take advantage of guilty? Well, there could be real tax costs to doing that. Um, there was a proposal in the Senate bill on tax reform that would have allowed a first-tier foreign subsidiary to distribute IP to its U.S. shareholder without, you know, on a tax-free basis, but that was not included in the final law. And so if a foreign subsidiary distributes IP and there's a substantial built-in gain, 
that gain could be subpart F income that's taxable in the U.S. at the full 21% rate, or it could be guilty that's taxed at the uh, reduced rate. And then, you know, anytime you're doing some kind of a transfer out of a foreign jurisdiction, there could be foreign income taxes or other transfer taxes on that transfer that you'd have to take into account. And then another consideration if, if you move IP to the U.S. is, well, what if, uh, what if circumstances change and, you know, there's a U.S. tax law change or there's more favorable law put in place in a foreign jurisdiction, can you move the IP back out of the U.S.? Well, that may be difficult to do without incurring a lot of U.S. tax because, for one thing, the uh, tax reform law repealed the active trader business exception under Section 367A, which formerly allowed U.S. persons to contribute property and not IP but other business property uh, to a foreign subsidiary on a tax-free basis as long as the subsidiary would use the property in an active foreign business. And then tax reform also codified a rule that was in uh, some recent Treasury regs uh, saying that goodwill and going concern value are intangible property for purposes of the 367D uh, commensurate with income super royalty rules. So uh, if you have property in the U.S. and you're moving it out of the U.S., it's going to be hard to do that really without uh, paying an exit tax. And, and, I, and I guess, you know, I've heard it, uh, the FDII component kind of described more as it's not so much or seen as, as perhaps an incentive to move IP back to the U.S. as it is to prevent future I, you know, IP in the future from moving outside the U.S. Because, you know, I think at least from, from my experience, you know, given the uncertainty about, you know, what will happen in the future with respect to, you know, the, the tax code and the tax system, a lot of people at this point aren't necessarily willing to, to kind of repatriate the IP but perhaps you know now the FDI is, is enough of an incentive to keep those assets here in the U.S. for the time being, and whereas in the past people would have looked to move them out. Yeah, I think that's right, and particularly given that the the rule that would have allowed IP to be kind of repatriated back to the U.S. on a tax-free basis, that the fact that that wasn't included in the legislation uh, that was would have been a bigger incentive to actually move IP to the U.S. So. You know, just thinking about different issues on FDII, one, one of the traps we wanted to cover is uh, using disregarded entities. And so you have on the left here a basic structure where a U.S. parent company owns a foreign corporation that holds IP. Uh, assume the foreign corporation uses the IP to make sales or perform services for foreign persons. Um, IP hold co's income from the licenses or, or from the uh, sales or services could be subpart F income and or guilty. Um, so the U.S. parent kind of in light of the new tax reform law uh, does calculations and decides that, well, if the IP were held in the U.S. because of the FDII deduction, uh, it would be better uh, on an overall basis to uh, own the IP in the U.S. But the U.S. parent doesn't actually want to move the IP to the U.S. perhaps there's foreign taxes on the transfer or a distribution of the IP would be um, would generate subpart F or guilty. And so the U.S. parent decides, okay, I'll check the box on IP hold co. That's generally uh, an inbound 332 liquidation. There'd be a, a deemed pickup under 367B of unrepatriated earnings, but that's generally a dividend for tax purposes. So you would think that is eligible for participation exemption. So U.S. parent says, okay, now I've got, I've got the IP uh, held in the U.S. through this disregarded entity, so now my income on the IP asset, that's FDII, and so now I'm in a better place than I was. And so the, the potential issue here, though, is that IP hold co, uh, if, if the income it earns is considered to be foreign branch income, that is one of the excluded items on the list of deduction eligible income. So. That, that's a type of income that is not eligible for the FDII deduction. And the test for foreign branch income is whether IP hold co or its activities is a qualified business unit, which is defined under the, the currency rules under 989. Um, and so if it's a qualified business unit, then its income is not eligible for the FDII deduction. So U.S. parents through this check the box election may have move from a, a situation where it had some subpart F and some guilty 
to a situation where all of its income is just subject to U.S. tax at the full corporate rate, which could be a worse result. And, and I guess, you know, the only theory I guess I could think of for this result, because if you think about it from a U.S. taxing perspective, you have a disregarded entity, all of the income is being taken in the U.S. from a U.S. perspective, right? So you would think that it should be okay, but I guess the only thing I could think of is that perhaps they were concerned that this could lead to some abuse because it still effectively resides in the foreign jurisdiction, that there would yeah. be some abuse potential between the interplay of like the U.S. and the foreign tax laws. Yeah, my thought was either that or, you know, if they are, are really trying to tell people you should have your activities physically based here and, you know, not have some foreign branch conducting the activities, that's not the type of behavior that they want to incentivize. So, true. Well, that's all on FDII. I'll turn it over to Don to talk about BEAT, another fun acronym. Okay. Yes, the, uh, the final acronym of the day, BEAT, or uh, Base Erosion and Anti-Abuse Tax. Uh, in, in short, the BEAT acts as a sword that seeks to discourage erosion of the U.S. tax base through the use of tax deductions for payments to foreign affiliates. The, uh, the tax acts basically as a minimum tax equivalent to AMT, but where the only preferences or addbacks are certain deductible payments made to foreign affiliates. Uh, as noted on the slide, the, the BEAT can create interesting results, including triggering a tax payable for a taxpayer that otherwise has a regular tax loss for the relevant year. The rate of BEAT generally is 10%, uh, but there is modest transition relief for 2018 in the form of a 5% rate for the one year, and then the rate is scheduled to increase after 2025 to 12.5% unless future legislation freezes the current rate. Okay. Uh, before going into the mechanics of its application, we first summarize here the, uh, the relevant taxpayer base for BEAT. Uh, so shown here, BEAT is a tax only on corporations, excluding those subject to preferential pass-through regimes such as RICs and REITs. Uh, small corporations are not targeted, so there is a 500 million gross receipts threshold for its application. And lastly, the payments deemed bad when made to foreign affiliates must represent at least 3% of the total payments made by the corporation. For an affiliate group of companies, the determinations of gross receipts and bad payments to foreign affiliates is made on an aggregate basis, uh, but significantly foreign companies only take into account amounts attributable to effectively connected income with a U.S. trade or business, and as a result, pure foreign operations of foreign affiliates are not taken into account. Okay, the B calculation. Uh, basically, we start with 10% of modified taxable income as defined here and compare it to the regular tax liability uh, of the taxpayer as, as reduced by available credits, except for certain credits that are allowable as an offset against B. Um, the excess of the 10% B tax over the credit reduced regular tax liability is the additional tax that is payable. The, uh, the credits that are allowable against BEAT and thus do not reduce the regular tax liability in the calculation are only a few as listed here, the, the research credit, the low-income housing credit, the production tax credit, and the ITC credit attributable to energy property. Other than the uh, research credit, the allowance is limited to 80% of the total amount of the credit. Um, this 80% allowance was a concession to the renewables industry, which had heavily lobbied Congress with the argument that BEAT was going to destroy the value of credits that were passed and extended over the years to promote the industry. And uh, while they won the concession, it is limited in time and expires after 2025. As to the definition of modified taxable income, uh, pretty simple. We start with regular taxable income and add back the base erosion tax benefit attributable to the, those tax deductible payments made to foreign affiliates. And we also add back NOL deductions using the, uh, the base erosion percentage applicable to the taxpayer. And, and I guess on, on that point, you know, at least I've seen some discussions where, you know, anytime you are in an NOL situation, you know, the way that BEAT works is that, you know, because it's based on this base erosion percentage, you're effectively losing value for your NOLs through the BEAT application. 
So that's just kind of the, a, a nuance, again, of the beat. Yeah, beat and, and, and same as the loss in value of credits, yeah. It's just, yeah. Okay, so for purposes of the calculation, uh, we now consider what constitutes a base erosion tax benefit. It is uh, fairly broadly defined and generally includes any deductible payment made to a foreign related party. Uh, it thus would include interest, royalties, and service fees. Uh, it also can include depreciation and amortization de deductions for property purchased from a foreign related party. And uh, finally, if a corporation is pursuing an outbound inversion transaction after the November 9th uh, date of introduction of legislation, the definition also includes any other payments that serve to reduce gross receipts. Uh, who is a foreign related party? Uh, generally any affiliate where there's a 25% or greater common ownership and typical stock attribution rules apply for purposes of determining relatedness. Uh, last note on this page, the informor information reporting rules have been expanded to require reporting of base erosion payments made by a company to its foreign affiliates. So now that we have identified the uh, parameters of base erosion payments under B, the next question would be, are there any exceptions? And uh, the happy answer is yes. Uh, First, amounts reducing gross receipts, such as cost of goods sold, are not considered a, deduct deduct a deductible payment. This is, a, this is valuable for manufacturers, but as, but as noted here, refer back to the uh, special rule for inversion transactions where reductions in gross receipts are treated as base erosion payments for those inverted companies. Uh, next, there's an exception for certain intercompany services uh, but the scope is less than clear. Uh, we'll discuss that further in the next slide. And like the old earnings stripping limitations on interest, there is an exception for payments that are fully subject to U.S. withholding tax on the theory that no base erosion is occurring in those cases. Uh, the exception is subject to downward adjustment, however, if the withholding rate is reduced under a tax treaty. And lastly here, uh, Certain payments under hedges and other derivatives are excluded if a number of requirements are met, uh, but the, the exclusion does not extend to payments that are viewed as disguised face erosion payments embedded in the form of a derivative. So if you had a derivative and there was some interest component embedded in it, the interest component seemingly can be pulled out and treated as a face erosion payment. Okay, as, as to the scope of the services exclusion, uh, fairly limited. It basically covers a list of various in-house administrative services that the IRS has identified as being eligible for re reimbursement without a markup from transfer pricing standpoint. Uh, so from the list, we see things like treasury, legal, accounting, tax, and HR functions. I think common to these functions is, is that they typically do not represent the key profit-making activities of a company, such as manufacturing and sales. Uh, which is what justifies the use of flat cost pricing under transfer pricing rules. Uh, but there is an important exception in the transfer pricing rules that disallows use of the, of the cost method if the services, in fact, contribute significantly to the fundamental risks of the business. So examples in the transfer pricing rules show that data entry, for example, may not be an eligible service if you are in the business of doing data entry for third-party customers and recruiting may not be an eligible, eligible service if you're an executive recruitment firm. However, um, for purposes of B, the exception for fundamental services does not apply. So such services are supposed to be eligible for the exclusion from B. And this presents a potential problem as the transfer pricing rules would say that a markup needs to be charged for those services and the B exclusion contemplates no markup. Uh, we'll talk a little bit further about this in a minute. Okay. And perhaps uh, one of the biggest questions as it relates to B is what Treasury and the IRS might do with a somewhat broad grant of regulatory authority. With the, uh, the newness of B, the boundaries of tax planning is somewhat unknown. So the anti-abuse authority granted for B allows the IRS to adjust the application of B, whatever that means, to prevent avoidance through the use of unrelated persons, conduits, or other intermediaries or transactions designed to change payments or their characters so that they would not be subject to beat. 
So with that authority, we pose here an example, uh, an IP license transformed into a partnership arrangement where the licensor instead receives a share of partnership profits rather than a royalty. Such an arrangement on its face could represent an arm's length transaction, uh, but if done with the purpose of minimizing fee tax, does the taxpayer lose? Uh, on questions like this, the uh, response thus far from the IRS has been no comment. Oh, and before uh, before you get to this next slide, Don, let me let me go ahead and read all the all important CLE code because we're about 50 minutes into the presentation. So um, again, all lawyers participating um, in this uh, webinar must note the following code on their affirmation form to earn the appropriate number of CLE credits. And the CLE code is 14395. And again, that's 14395. All right, back to you, Don. All right, so now we'll, uh, we'll briefly talk about some potential issues that arise from this new provision. Uh, first, we, re we uh, return to the services exclusion, and the question is whether it is available if a service fee includes a markup, um, and, and whether the, uh, the exclusion is available at least to the extent of the cost component. Uh, as drafted, the exclusion only requires that the services being provided be eligible for use of uh, cost reimbursement transfer pricing, it does not require that that method actually be adopted. So it seems like there should be the possibility to bifurcate a service fee and claim a beat exclusion for the cost component and subject only the markup component to beat. As discussed on the earlier slide, um, because fundamental services uh, are not eligible for cost pricing under transfer pricing methodology, uh, a different reading of the provision could render beat, the beat exclusion unworkable for fundamental services, um, and this does not seem like uh, the intended result given the, given the express carve-out in, uh, in the code provision. Uh, finally, we just note here that if it was required to go to a flat cost uh, methodology for certain services that could impact taxation in foreign jurisdictions, if they suddenly see uh, markup-based methodologies going to flat cost uh, and reducing the amount of income flowing into their into their jurisdictions. Next, partnerships. Um, beat by its terms only applies to corporations. So, what about payments made by a partnership to a foreign affiliate of one of its partners? Uh, the IRS presumably would want to treat the partnership as an aggregate uh, in applying beat and tribute the payment to the corporate partner. I think the uh, anti-abuse regulations under subchapter K would suggest that the IRS can do so, uh, as they have with other code provisions that apply to only corporations. Um, and so I think that's what we might expect uh, in the context of the, the beat regime. Disallowed interest, uh, under, under the Tax Act, we now have a cap on interest deductions for most businesses at 30% of taxable income. Uh, to the extent that interest paid to a foreign affiliate is disallowed in the current year, uh, but is utilized in the later years of carry forward, we have a question as to whether BEAT can be opposed in the later year. Uh, the answer is not clear under the statute, but we probably know what the IRS would say. Okay. Uh, on netting, uh, the BEAT provision focuses on a taxpayer's bad deductions to foreign affiliates. It does not take into account situations where a taxpayer might have income that offsets those deductions, such as in back-to-back -back financing arrangements or contracting, subcontracting arrangements. Uh, in those situations, BEAT can produce distorted results. Um, so for an example, we consider a service provider. Uh, if, we, if we just uh, assume that the service provider receives $100 in service fees from an affiliate uh, but pays $90 to a foreign affiliate under a subcontract, uh, without a netting rule, that service provider conceivably owes you know, $10 plus in tax under the beat regime, which essentially is its entire profit under the contracting arrangements. And a different result would be obtained if the arrangement were restructured to get the service provider out from under the middle. Uh, and we'll look at an example of that in the final slides. Uh, next, um, if a payment to a foreign affiliate gives rise to subpart F for guilty inclusions, there's the possibility of double taxation arising as there's no overlap rule at the moment. Um, perhaps uh, some form of a previously taxed income exception would be appropriate, uh, but it's not clear how it would be implemented under the statutory regime. Uh, 
And finally, we see that the value of foreign tax credits is reduced or limited under B because they reduced the regular tax liability in the B calculation and did not receive the special treatment afforded to the research credit, PTCs, and the energy credit. Okay, um, we can wrap the discussion by considering possible BEAT planning opportunities and contrasting good and bad ways to structure transactions in a BEAT world. Uh, so in this example, we have a U.S. opco paying a foreign affiliate royalties for a license on IP, which is a taxable base erosion payment unless an exception is available. The U.S. opco also is buying product from the foreign affiliate, which is excluded from BEAT as a cost of goods sold item. As an alternative, the cost of the IP rights might be included in the price charged for the product so as to avail of the cost of goods sold exclusion for the overall transaction. Um, prior to B, such a contractual arrangement might not be atypical, and the question that arises is whether uh, using such a structure under B could run afoul of the anti-abuse rule. And in this regard, you know, I'd go back and look at the carve-out from the qualified derivatives exception for disguised payments and suggest that perhaps there's the avenue for the IRS to take a similar approach uh, for something that is attempted to be disguised as cost of goods sold. Okay, so as in another example, we consider an intercompany services arrangement that includes subcontracting by the service providing affiliate to an outside party. In the classic case, the affiliated service provider um, might contract with that outside party and pass along the cost pursuant to the intercompany arrangement. Uh, but with B, and without some netting mechanism, this approach seemingly has the result of increasing the amount of the taxable base erosion payments, even though part of the cost is being passed on to a third party. Now, future guidance might provide some relief in these situations, but until then, a better approach might be to have the U.S. OPCO contract directly with the unrelated service provider, and that would have the effect of minimizing the amount of basic erosion payments to the foreign affiliate. Well, thank you, Don, and, and thank you, everybody, for, for participating. That's the end of our uh, second part of our international uh, tax reform webinar. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Um, again, if you have any additional questions related to any of the items and the materials, please email them to Megan Green at megan.green at bakerbots.com. And then, as mentioned, please include the announced uh, CLE code on the affirmation form, which you can download, download in the reminder email, which was sent to you yesterday. And again, if you do not have this form, please email Megan Green at megan.green at bakerbots.com. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>